Hello everyone, welcome to 1.5 Degrees, the podcast where together we explore the science solutions and stories involved in the fight against climate change. I'm your host Heidi Pan, speaking with the professionals behind the latest research, policies, culture, and innovations shaping our response to global environmental challenges. For today's episode, we are joined by Anya Kamenetz, who is an awarding journalist, former NPR correspondent, and current advisor to the Aspen Institute and Climate Mental Health Network to discuss her work in generational justice, building a child centric society and more at the intersection of youth and climate change. Anya's newsletter, The Golden Hour, is about thriving and raising thriving kids on a changing planet. Her fifth book is The Stolen Year, How COVID Changed Children's Lives and Where We Go Now. Thank you so much for joining us today, Anya. It's truly an honor. Thanks for having me, Heidi. Yeah, um, so I mean, I feel like at this point we've met a few times, but for listeners, can you tell us more about what it is that you do? Yeah, um, sure. So basically, uh, I'm a journalist by craft. I have been reporting for various outlets and writing and producing radio and podcasts for many, many years. And I've written five books and they all touch on things having to do with young people and very broadly. And I have gotten more and more kind of obsessed with the climate over the last few years. And that ultimately led to me leaving my job, um, which was a great job at NPR in 2022. And focusing, um, seeing what I could do kind of full-time at this intersection, which is combining some traditional journalism and also some advocacy as well. Yeah, I mean, I I wanted to talk about that pivot, especially like since, you know, you said like Um, Mm mid-2022 ish. I mean, you've said that since you've done that, you've felt less cognitive dissonance between your, your everyday activities, fears for the future and dismays in the present, and also less isolated, which... I really relate to. Um, I, I guess, like, can you talk a bit more about what it is, you know, like, how did you get to where you are today and what sparked that transition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think one of the best things about it has honestly been the opportunity to speak to so many people and meet people like you who are really making this their passion um, and going right for it. So, I mean, I've always been interested in social justice and making the world a better place through the lens of journalism. And I think that there's a lot of amazing ways to do that. The issue that I think I was facing as a journalist who wanted to write about the climate was basically one of tone. A lot of times our, you know, the subtext of our news every day is like, oh, everything is horrible, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, everything is kind of normal. So like one story kind of bleeds into the next and, and there's always 24 hours of reporting whether or not anything's really going on. Mm -hmm. So um, thinking about how to break the mold of journalism a little bit and be in a space where I could actually share feelings about what was happening and be um, open and honest about how I was feeling really helped me. Um, And so since then, um, while I do do some traditional reporting, I'm also oftentimes in spaces where I'm really thinking a lot about how does climate change make us feel um, and acting on that in a whole bunch of different ways. So Yeah. I mean, I think that's been the greatest benefit of this. And I think the other part of it, it just is like, you know, making the thing that I think is most important front and center to my life every day does make me feel a lot more um, dedicated and energized and, and able to keep going. Yeah, no, I can totally see that. It's like, because because climate change, you know, at its core, hasn't just been about the environment, but it's also like a human and very emotional issue. And I mean, like, you focus then on those emotional effects on youth as well. And I mean, for some, I guess, like context and background for listeners, can you share some insights on how children and young people currently respond emotionally or action-wise to the climate crisis? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been interested in climate psychology um, ever since I met uh, Margaret Klein Salomon about five years ago. And she's a psychologist who actually ended up founding the Climate Emergency Fund. Mm-hmm. Um, and they they help fund and support kind of frontline uh, activists all over the world. Um, but she was really one who, who got me thinking about, well, one of the keys to the mystery of why we haven't acted collectively to stop climate change is the incredibly powerful feelings that it brings about in people, feelings of dread, feelings of anxiety and grief and loss, and all of which are so aversive. We try to make a space between ourselves and those feelings. Yeah. And that is in that space, oftentimes, you know, sometimes it's healthy to do a little bit of distancing. Other times it's denial and denial means pretending like everything is fine and we can just keep going on with business as usual. Um, But young people are kind of the canaries in the coal mine of Mm -hmm. climate mental health because they are out there 
expressing a very high level of distress about what is happening to the planet. And um, this generation is oftentimes thought of as having a vulnerability around their mental health. And I think that's, there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. I also think that there's a huge power in just naming um, how people are feeling and what they're going through. And so young people are very willing to do that. So for adults, my kind of charge um, for people of my generation and older is to listen to what young people are telling us. Don't pathologize them, but think together about what your responsibility is and how you can help um, people. Because the only way that we manage our climate emotions is not only by dealing with the emotions themselves, but also by taking action. Yeah, that's that's a really important lens to look on this, and I, I appreciate your approach to to covering this topic. Um, you've also like in the past touched on, or more recently rather, you, you touched on the the effects of COVID nineteen on young people as well. I mean, there's there's been especially, I mean, even in my experience, there's been overlap between my experience during the pandemic and then becoming more climate aware. I mean, what are some of the effects that kind of overlap that you've observed? If any. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, starting in in 2020, obviously I was going through this myself mm-hmm. um, as a parent of two kids who mm-hmm. were three and eight in March 2020. Um, as a reporter, I was covering the, the national education system for um for NPR. I ended up writing a book about the COVID-19 pandemic impact on young people. And I focused on the experiences of five families from around the country, as well as, you know, very, very much um across the board. And I think there are similarities to the extent that, first of all, you know, there are these massive um, catastrophes going on that are global in scale, that are um, really overwhelming, that take a lot of, you know, the best that we have as a species in terms of science, technology, but also social innovation to try to meet the challenge and rise above it. Um, But the near term impact on young people has been devastating. I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic obviously shut schools around the world. Um, It intensified this mental health crisis, this feeling of isolation um, of, uh, you know, I called my book The Stolen Year because it talked about how people really felt like their futures had been taken away. And I think that we are losing our ability as a society to really make space for what has happened. So, you know, there's a real propensity to rush into, you know, the future and forget Mm -hmm. about the past. Mm -hmm. We deserve a chance to really honor what what young people went through and what all of us went through and not to bury it. Mm. Yeah, that definitely applies to everything and climate. Yeah, for sure. Um, Yeah. yeah, And I really liked the title because sometimes to me, I'm like, where did 2020 go? I've I've seen online a lot of phenomena with young people and just anyone in general that we've just what happened in that year. (laughs) And uh, yeah, no, but that's so true. We have to like acknowledge it and allow ourselves to like, you know, take care of our feelings in that sense for sure. Um, yeah, and I mean, I guess like from from moving on from that, like from your experience in researching, writing, um, like what in your mind is essential to building the child centric society that we need. Right. So um, I guess I would say the flip side to considering um, huge global challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic and the climate crisis in terms of their impact on youth is that once we start making decisions with young people in the future in mind, we are multi-solving. So we're solving for many, many things at once. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about what is a child-centric city, for example, a child-centric neighborhood, Um, First of all, we support mothers, we support parents, anyone who wants to have a child, they have resources, they have stable housing, they have um, clean water to drink, they have clean air to breathe when they're growing a child in their bodies, Um, they have health care, right? Um, They have, once the child is born, they have uh, support with pediatricians, they have support with doulas, they have Mm -hmm. uh, close-knit neighborhoods and strong social networks coming together to support that child. Um, and they also have walkable neighborhoods. There's also play spaces. There's also green spaces. Mm-hmm. There's also car-free areas, right? There's access to clean and healthy food for people to eat. Children have access to nature um, to see how food is grown so that they can you know, develop a healthy relationship with the world around them. And so building outward from that sort of mother and child or parent and child dyad, you can see how in concentric rings, we can start to construct a society that's really truly better for everyone. And I I would defy you to kind of think of an example of a, a place where we make things better for kids and we're not actually just making it better for human beings. Yeah, 
no, I mean, kids are human beings and they'll grow up to become a society, like part of a functioning society and adults. And yeah, no, that's so true. And that's a perspective I haven't really thought of, but maybe that's something I've been wanting all along. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I mean, I guess like, could you tell me more about then the golden hour? You're, I think like some sort of tagline is like the, you know, talking about thriving, but also raising thriving children too. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I started this Substack, um, basically to have kind of a weekly place to put some of these ideas and thoughts. And it really kind of encompasses kind of some of the needs that I have as a parent, um, but also what I see um, for other people who are bringing up young people who are teaching, who are taking care of kids and working with young people, um, as well as young people themselves. And this is about really the emotional impact of living through these times. So, you know, of course, you know, there's information there about taking climate action, but there's also information about climate emotions. So one of the resources that we created with Climate Mental Health Network is a climate emotions wheel. And um, it's based on research and it shows kind of the spectrum of different climate emotions that you can feel um, in a day or in a month or in a year. And what we're trying to do is really build literacy. So the hope is that, um, you know, parents take care of themselves. They can also help with their kids, help their kids learn about their climate emotions, and then be able to process those emotions. And of course, taking action is always going to be part of that. But we also want to make sure that um, we're resourcing ourselves, right? That we're supporting ourselves. I've got interviews in the in the newsletter with people who are doing group work where they're bringing parents together to talk about dealing with the climate crisis. Um, I had an interview last week with a sort of mindfulness teacher who wrote about um, different kinds of qualities that we want to cultivate to both work for social justice and do our personal growth work at the same time. He talked a lot about how like becoming a parent a little bit older in his life really led to being a terrific patience teacher. He's like, I've been teaching meditation for 25 years, but there's nothing like taking care of a baby to really push your edges and, and your, and your patience there. So really trying to figure out this convergence and figure out, um, you know, raise the awareness both on the sort of general um, mental health and wellness side of things and also on the climate side of things and get parents interested in this conversation because I firmly believe that, you know, every parent in the world is dealing with climate change. Every young person is dealing with climate change. We, this is a completely universal experience. So why not have more tools to, for dealing with it? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. We definitely need more of like that support for parents in addition to youth in the space, like both of them are incredibly intertwined. And I guess like, then in, in your view, what role can parents um, like yourself and educators, caregivers play in preparing children for the challenges posed by climate change, you know, in, in terms of mental health and like, I guess, like practical adaptation and whatnot? Yeah. I mean, I've been really moved by your work in this area and your acronym um, where you're really, you know, as a young person speaking to adults and letting them know how to let you in and how to include you and how to foreground you. I think that the, there's something, you know, that's been endemic in the climate movement, at least, you know, since the emergence of Greta Thunberg, which is this idea that the kids are going to fix it, the kids are going to do it all. Thank God for them. And it's really a way for older people to excuse themselves yeah. um, from feeling implicated, I think, in a way. So you know, my hope is just for meaningful coexistence and collaboration. Oh, I think yeah. that no matter what generation you're a part of, we all share a really vital um, interest in making sure that we solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, what I would love to do is just raise awareness of young people as a most affected group, right? So we know that, you know, in, in social justice movements, we always want to lift up the voices mm -hmm. of the people most affected. And um, concretely speaking, as a parent, you know, it's nice for kids, and I've heard this from parent activists, it's really nice for kids to know that parents are working on it so that the kids can feel like it's not their job to do it alone. The parents are the ones with the resources. The parents are the ones with the social capital most of the time um, and the money to actually get active on the problem. So you should be taking the lead. And if your kids have you know, act, 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 activism that they wanna do, that's really great and you should support them and give them all the help and the coaching that they require. But honestly, this should be a two generation um, activity. Um, I also think that parents have a role to play in sort of supplying these coping tools, right? So helping, you know, the very hard thing to do when you are younger that I recall is just like putting things in perspective because you don't have the perspective, right? Everything is immediate and everything is a big deal. Um, and so 
giving the opportunity without being, you know, patronizing or condescending, but giving the opportunity to have self-care, to, you know, distract or distance yourself, or just to really know that you're not alone. Right. So like building that mental health support so that young people know that climate emotions are totally normal. They're totally common and um, it's okay to have them and to share them and, and even to feel despair sometimes, even to feel like you're, you know, exhausted and you don't want to do it anymore, or you just want to break. Mm -hmm. All of that is completely okay. And the more parents know about climate emotions, I think the more supportive it can be. Yeah, no, for sure. That like reduction of stigma and support, it really can start in in the household. And I I, like from the perspective of a young person, I totally agree with that. Thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, like in, in terms of related initiatives, are there any that are upcoming that you're able to talk about that are like you're excited about in your work with both the Aspen Institute and also the Climate Mental Health Network? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much going on. Um, but right now I'm in the middle of conducting focus groups with parents to improve this resource that we created. We created a set of PDFs um, that are basically a one-on-one guide for parents to have a climate emotions conversation with their kids. And we got this very tiny grant to conduct focus groups to talk to parents across the country and get feedback on these resources. And then um, hopefully we're going to be able to extend the grant a little bit, get a little more funding and improve the resources so that they can be kind of a two generation um, resource that people, anybody can use if they want to have an intergenerational emotional climate conversation. Um, just get the ball rolling, share how you feel, share um, how you cope, you know, figure out, demonstrate some self-care practices. And um, I, my hope is that, that this starts to get accepted and integrated anywhere that we're having climate conversations, whether we're learning about it in school, whether we have activist groups, um, or even just with your friends, that people have the ability to say, you know what, we know that this is an emotional conversation, like this is not neutral information. And so how do we deal with that? And how do we incorporate that um, and support each other so we can keep going? Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, uh, I guess like in in terms of like, I guess we're kind of wrapping down towards the advice section. Um, yeah. If you could, if you could turn back time, butterfly effects aside and talk to your younger self could be like around my age, starting college or before that, even like for, or early in your career, anytime. Um, what is something that you've learned from life so far that you would share with them? Great question. Um, I was a kid who always hit my marks and kind of did the next best expected thing. And so mm-hmm. my big advice for my 16 year old self, and I don't think she would take it, would be to break the mold a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, set out, you do a little more traveling, do some volunteering, get yourself in some situation, you know, where you don't necessarily have such a clear cut goal because those are the types of opportunities that that tend to close themselves off a little bit later on in life. Mm-hmm. That's good advice. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. yeah. And I mean, what advice would you have for youth in the climate space and even the adults in their lives? My advice is to really pay attention. You know, I share in some of my presentations, a graphic from Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, where she talks about the intersection between like what needs doing, what you're good at, but also what brings you joy, because we're all in this for the long haul. We are all going to be fighting to ameliorate the climate crisis for the rest of our lives. And so what's really important is that you find a space that you can dedicate yourself to that you really care about, but also that feels good for you, that feels like it's the best use of your talents. I mean, every job and every everything everywhere has boring parts. It all has, there's always washing the dishes and there's always doing your taxes. But if it's a thing that like you really love to do, um, the chances that you stick with it are going to be much higher. That's so true. Thank you. Um, and I guess like what advice or resources would you give to those that are interested in pursuing your field of work? Well, in terms of becoming a journalist, um, I would say that it is a constantly moving target. Um, and I wish I paid more attention as a young person to some of like the networking opportunities in my sphere, because as a journalist, I was always interested in the people that I was writing about sort of my sources more so than I was like my colleagues. Um, but that was, but like, it's good to meet people who want to do what you want to do and, and kind of try to figure it out together. And I think starting up publications, I mean, there's never been a worse time, but there's also never been a better time starting podcasts, starting your own, you know, Substack, like it's, 
it's all, it's all entrepreneurs out there. So you might as well just like mm-hmm. cut your teeth on it. I think you're a great example of that, honestly, Heidi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I also say the same, like it's, it's like, if you have internet access, it's becoming more accessible to really share your voice out there. Even if, you know, there's no one letting you in, like you could just let yourself in. Yeah. I agree. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And um, I guess like what, what, um, what resources would you recommend to those that are experiencing climate emotions now? Oh my gosh, there's so many good ones out there. Yeah. Um, Jen, Dredd, <laughs> Jen Dredd, the, the Brit Ray Substack um, is a great source. Uh, the Good Grief Network, um, Climate Psychology Alliance, um, these resources that we're we're working on at climatementalhealth.net. There's also, we have a Gen Z task force. So there's, um, you know, resources there as well. Um, All We Can Save is another organization that has um, climate mental health resources. I think the biggest thing you can do is just talk to someone about it, you know, um, start a conversation. Again, this is something that affects every single person. And so when I started telling people that I'm working on climate emotions, they're like, climate emotions, what's that? And I'm like, well, you know how you feel when you read about the wildfires or the latest heat wave? And then they're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, those things, those feelings. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, the awareness part of it is just like getting it out there. Like I, even when I'm speaking with my mom, like there's that, like at first she was like, there's, there's a subset of psychology that's focused on climate. And uh, yeah, no, but, but yeah, no, thank you for that. And um, this is, this is a question I meant to ask earlier, but because I can ask now, um, what is a like least favorite or favorite aspect of what you do now? One of the hardest parts or the part that I guess the both the thing I'm trying to unlock. So the date, the opportunity is, well as the hard part is there's two major strikes here like people don't want to hear about climate change they also don't want to hear about unhappy emotions like mm-hmm. you know thinking about these icky emotions like we spend in our entire culture especially american culture is really against sort of the dark side so we're it's sort of like this toxic positivity mm-hmm. mindset at all costs and so getting people to show up for this conversation can feel like pulling teeth sometimes mm-hmm. um, and I would say what I'm engaged in, like at a level of like rhetorically or from as a communications puzzle or or challenge or quest, right, is how do you how do you turn that into something exciting? Like how do you make people say, ooh, I do want to feel my feelings. I do want to have a what broader range of emotion because I have a little hunch that I've been numbing myself because I'm afraid of my feelings. And if I were actually to lean into those feelings, I would discover an incredible sense of power, an incredible sense of joy, because everything that I don't allow myself to feel, you know, you don't just numb the bad stuff, you also numb the good stuff. So Mm -hmm. this sense of excitement that I have, the, the hope that I have, the amount of compassion and connection that I feel for other beings on this earth, which is what makes me so afraid of losing everything, those that's what's waiting for you on the other side mm-hmm. of this door that you're like holding shut against the monsters yeah oh wow I like that visual no I agree completely like I feel like my for me like the emotional aspect is something that I've been tapping into more recently and trying to practice and ever since like you know it it is definitely a painful process but it, it is rewarding yeah um but yeah, no, thank you so much for for having this conversation with me. I guess like for for listeners who want to keep up with the work that you do, uh, where can they find you? Um, definitely at, at the Substack, the Golden Hour. And Heidi, thank you so much for this conversation. It was great talking to you. Thank you so much, Anya, for, for all you do. 